is um, a couple chapters. It's I know the title here says just traditional film processing, but the chapters are parts of seven, nine, twenty-five, and twenty-six. And um, you may have noticed already that some things from those chapters were taught previously, and now we're kind of circling back to pick up some other um, parts from those chapters. Um, so it's um, it's a little bit, the chapters are kind of a little bit chopped up throughout, throughout this course. Um, so here are the objectives for, um, pretty much I think we're starting off with some things for chapter seven. So here's some um, objectives to start out with. There's more later on in this um, slide deck, but. So when we um, think about traditional film, a lot of us um, may never even use it at all in your career by this point. Some of you who have been dental assistants um, probably have used traditional film. Um, and then if you work in certain in, um, certain industries or certain um, practices, you may still um, use traditional film. If you work for an older dentist who hasn't transitioned over or if you work in public health, um, so sometimes you you may come across this. So it's good to it's still out there. So it's good to learn about them. Um, so the components of a traditional film, um, it's layered material um, that's sort of surrounding a film. So you can see here, um, you have this sort of outer plastic packet, or this one looks like it's made of plastic and it has some um, cardboard or some paper as well. Um, and then you have a sheet of lead foil. And then you have a film that is kind of wrapped in this black um, inner paper. And so that's, um, and then all, that's all stuffed into this sort of plastic envelope. So the plastic film is coated on both sides with an emulsion. Um, it's wrapped in that black paper, and then there's a thin sheet of foil um, on the back side. And then the plastic cover, and then there is an embossed dot. So remember when we were mounting, we said the, the dot goes up. Um, there's also that saying the dot goes in the slot, so um, when you slide the film into the film holder, you want the embossed dot to go down into the bottom of the slot because that's going to be where the occlusal surface or the incisal surface is. And inside the film there can be one, or inside the packet there can be one film or there can be two. And two films would make it so that there's a duplicate. There's two films of the same image. So different types of film, um, oftentimes through the manufacturer, they're going to be color-coded for speed and for um, how many films are in the packet. So this um, D film up here has a single film inside for green, and then there's two films inside the gray packet. So say you wanted to take a PA and then send a, send a copy to the endodontist, so something like that. That's why you'd have um, double films. So when we record the image, when we expose the film or record the image, um, the film is what we use to record the, the image, or we would use an, a receptor like a sensor, but right now we're talking about um, traditional film. So the film is what we use, it's the medium that we use to record the image. Um, it, the film itself is covered with an active emulsion. This active emulsion is sensitive to radiation. It's a homogeneous mixture of gelatin and then these silver halide, halide crystals. So the gelatin probably just um, keeps everything sort of um, homogeneous, but the active part of this emulsion is the silver halide crystals. So silver halide is, makes up about 90 to 99 percent of the emulsion, and then the other 1 to 10 percent is silver iodide. So when an X-ray photon hits the surface of the film and it hits the surface of that emulsion, a latent image is formed. And a latent image means that there's an image in there, but it's not, you can't see it yet. So it's, um, you have to do something else before you can see that image. So something chemically has happened and changed the structure, but you're not going to reveal it until later. So that's why they call it a latent image. Um, so the base, is a thin plastic um, made of flexible polyester that's coated on both sides uh, with this emulsion. So that's what the, the actual like film that you're holding is just a thin plastic. But it's that emulsion that makes that, that image come on. 
the um, thin the base or that thin plastic film hat is um, tinted blue um, so that you can see through it easier um, it provides a stable support for the emulsion as well it gives it a nice solid structure and then there's the protective layer um, which is a transparent layer to protect the emulsion um, from you know different reactions from light and the scratching and things like that so it kind of gives it a little bit of a protection so here's two different images of the same thing. It's just this is more of a 3D image and this is a 2D image showing that there's this thin transparent co um, protective coating. Then you have your emulsion and then there's some kind of an adhesion of the emulsion to your um, transparent plastic base, which is blue tinted. So it just kind of shows the same thing here. And that's what makes up the film inside your packet. So the whole process of um, film processing is to convert that latent image to a visible image. So when you expose the film to radiation, something happens and then it, a latent image is now on the film. So now we want to make it visible. So it, also, it makes that image visible and then it also preserves the image so it doesn't go away. It's, it fixes it right there for you to have as long as you know, hopefully if, if it stays in, in a protected area, the image should last a long time. So the process here, um, there's the development and then there's the fixing. So the development takes place over time. Um, the top early stage silver um, being deposited and then the bottom development is complete. And the silver deposits where the film was um, exposed to x-rays. So it's basically you get this um, initiation of the, the developer starts to transform the way that the silver that was, was hit by the radiation, it starts to trans, um, transform it and turn it into um, black or shades of gray, depending on how much radiation that silver, um, those silver particles received. So let's look at this next slide. It talks about it a little bit more. So the film is, um, is placed in the chemical known as the developer solution for a specific amount of time and at a specific temperature and that's really important. Temperature is really important. Um, the developer distinguishes between the little particles, the crystals that were exposed to radiation and then the ones that were not exposed to radiation. So the, de the developer so solution will have an effect on anything that had been exposed. To the radiation. The developer initiates a chemical reaction that reduces the exposed silver halide crystals into a black metallic silver and creates dark or black areas on the um, dental radiograph. So basically anything that got that radiation absorbed starts to turn black. The unexposed silver halide crystals remain virtually unaffected by the developer. So then we go into the next phase which is the fixation. So the fixation is going to remove those non-developed crystals from the film. So half, not half, but you know, however many of those crystals that got radiation have turned black. Now anything that wasn't radiated turns white. It produces the light areas on the film in areas where the x-ray, there's um, little x-ray exposure. And then it also preserves or fixes the developed crystals and hardens the emulsion to protect the film. So it kind of takes the areas that turned black from the developer and it fixes those so it kind of makes those nice and permanent but then it also washes away any of the, um, the crystals that never um, were never reacted with the radiation so then you have your, your white areas on the film. The film is placed in chemical, this is sort of a little bit of a redundant film um, sent, uh, slide I think. The film is placed in a chemical known as the fixer solution for a specific amount of time. The fixer solution removes the unexposed silver halide crystals and creates white or clear areas on the dental radiograph. Meanwhile, the black metallic silver is not removed and remains on the film. And those, like we said previously, those get sort of fixed and um, become more permanent on the film. And then this is just a little schematic kind of starting to show how you have all your silver halide crystals. You put it in the developer, they start to change. Oops. Some of them change to um, black, and then during the fixation period, the black gets 
gets kind of made permanent and then the other stuff gets washed away. So film processing, there's automatic film processors. You may um, see one that's in a dark room um, or you could see one that has what they call a daylight loader and that's this guy down here where you stick your hands into this box that's in front of this. So then um, this kind of hangs on the front here and you stick your films in there but through the box. And that's if you don't, if the office is small and just doesn't have a designated dark room. So here's a picture of an automatic processor. So you'd feed it in the front. It goes through all these rollers. It travels through these rollers down into the developer and then out of the developer and then into the fixer and then out of the fixer and then into water and then out of the water and then through these drying chambers and then it comes out the other side. So this would show you how important, you know, when we talk about things like replenishing your developer and replenishing your fixer and making sure the temperature is just right. Because if these levels get low, then your film may have a developer cut off or have a fixer cut off. So the keys to processor maintenance, it's important there's always a schedule. Um, you know, what, whether it's like a monthly maintenance or a weekly maintenance or something like that, but it's just important that it's maintained at these reg regular intervals, change solution at regular intervals, replenish the solution daily. Um, the solution, both the developer and the fixer can become depleted from evaporation and the solution being removed um, when the films go through it. You know, a little bit of film, a little bit of solution gets, you know, taken away every time films go through there. So um, it's important to have those replenished. So now we'll talk about digital imaging a bit. These are the objectives for that. This is, I believe, now we're going to be um, moving on to chapter 25, I think is where this digital imaging is mostly talked about. Um, so di digital imaging, um, so what is it? It's basically a filmless imaging system. It's computerized imaging system converts energy into visual images. And it's um, the use of the term image is preferred over radiograph because it is really almost more of like a, a picture than a traditional x-ray radiograph. But you still hear people call it everything from film to picture to image to radiograph. I mean, it's just people say all sorts of things. So um, analog versus digital. So traditional film is analog. It's data expressed in a continuous form. Examples are a painting, a traditional radiograph, a traditional photograph. Analog um, is a radiographic image produced by conventional film is um, another um, definition. The digital is data expressed in discrete form and structurally ordered areas or pixels. An example is a digital radiograph or a mosaic. So digital image is an image composed of pixels that can be stored in a computer. Pixels and spatial re um, resolution. So pixels are tiny storage dots that compose a digital image. And their spatial resolution is the number and size of pixels within an image. The more pixels in an image, the greater the spatial resolution, and that gives you a much sharper and clearer image. So we think about this when we think of what kind of phone we're going to get, and how, or you know, digital camera, and how, what's the pixels, because that will give us a sharper, clear image. So here's an example of how the pixels get smaller and smaller, and the image gets clearer and clearer. So we have different types of digital systems. We have a direct system. This is important for you guys to remember for the exam. Um, a direct system, where, um, which is a CCD, which is a charged coupling device. And that is what we have in the patient's mouth, is the charged coupling device, the sensor. So the indirect system, um, an example of that would be the PSP, or the Phosphostimulable Storage Phosphor photostimulable storage phosphor or phosphor plates. And that is not connected to the computer. And so you take that and you have to scan it in a scanning machine, which is connected to the computer. So there's an extra step there. So direct digital systems is one step process. 
You do not need a film. The image is acquired by a wired sensor, and its most common sensor is a CCD or the charged coupling device. So in, within the charged coupling device um, is all, all these little wells. So sensor, the sensor that contains a silicon chip with an electronic circuit embedded in it. So that's the, what this is. The silicone chip is sensitive to X-ray or to light, and then visualized as a grid of pixels or wells, you can see all these little wells on the CCD, where electrons are stored after exposure. So when you put this in the patient's mouth behind a tooth, depending on what structure was in front of the sensor, depends on how much, how many electrons are gonna be stored in these wells. So equivalent to the silver halide crystals on a traditional film. So you can see over here, like this is a well looking, you know, from the side instead of looking, this is like looking down into the well. This is like looking um, at the side of the well. So, and then the black bar is the number of electrons trapped in each pixel. So if you have an area that um, got a lot of exposure and a lot of radiation went through there and hit the sensor, then it's going to load up within one of those pixels lots of electrons. So that would be an example of the PDL or the, the pulp. Lots of radiation went through the tooth and hit the sensor. Um, down here on this end, where just a little bit of electrons hit the sensor, is your um, enamel or your amalgam. So most of it got absorbed in the tooth structure or the, or the restoration, and l less um, electrons actually hit the, um, or x-ray photons, hit the, um, the sensor here. And so then the image is whiter or lighter on the, on the um, computer when you actually see the image. So here's an, just another um, image kind of breaking down the analog, which is kind of like your um, drawn image, you know, like a more of a traditional photograph. And then you have it um, digitized where they break it down into segments um, and into um, kind of, you can see how it's like light and dark areas um, throughout. I'm not exactly sure what they're talking about with the numbers, but they're kind of just breaking down how um, each section is going to have a, a different amount of pixels or different amount of radiation depending on um, the area. And so I think that's what the, all the different little numbers, depending on the darkness or the different shades of gray. Advantages and disadvantages of di um, direct digital imaging. So advantages were, would, of course, be that it's instantaneous. We love that. There's great resolution, lots of detail. We love that. And then the sensor is reusable, so it's kind of economical in some ways and environmentally friendly. Disadvantages as that you cannot use conventional film holders, so it's a pretty big investment up front. You have to use barriers um, to cover it because it's not autoclavable. And then, of course, the wire can get damaged or be captured in images. And so you have to think about that. And then it's very rigid and thick. They've made it much better. That This is the Dexis one that I've always loved. I used that in practice. And I always thought that that was far better than like the Schick or there were some other ones that were really big. Um, but still, it's very rigid. There's no bending this. And so, you know, either a patient can handle it or they or they can't. Um, and it's just one size, although um, there are you, they do sell like pedo size, but pretty much people just buy the one size sensor. Indirect digital system is the um, photo um, stimulable storage phosphor. So this is that two-step process. You put the little um, phosphorus plate um, in the patient's mouth to be exposed. Um, and then you take it out and you have to run it through a scanner and then you have to kind of reset it with a lighting system to sort of re blank it out and then you can reuse it again. They're wireless, um, they're reusable, they're soft and a little bit more flexible, but you cannot bend them like you could traditional film. Traditional film used to be able to like bend the corners and you can't do that with this system. But they're a little bit more flexible and they certainly are thinner. So the phosphorus plates, they have you reuse them um, by putting them in, inside these little sleeves and then you just um, take them out of these sleeves um, and then you um, put them in a little box to kind of reset them. 
um, but they get scanned in a laser scanner, digital interface card, um, they show up on the computer and then they're in your software. So then you can treat them like a digital image once they get in the computer, but it's an extra step. And of course you can see here they come in different sizes, which is nice. Um, here's the scanner, so you go, they go in here and, and then they pop out the bottom. So advantages to digital imaging, it is a time saver um, for sure. You know, there's no dark room, there's no chemicals that you have to recycle or purchase um, that are kind of caustic. Um, the image can be enhanced. Um, there's much less radiation to the patient, which is wonderful. Images can be shared readily with other doctors, other professionals, or emailed, you know, to the patient. Images can be shared, um, oh, I said that already, improved workflow, um, so, you know, it's really helped out in a lot of ways. The doctor can pull up an image in his office and then come in and have his, you know, know what he wants to say to the patient. Um, Long-term cost savings, but it is, in, you know, expensive up front. And then advancement in patient education, so wonderful tool for education. Image enhancement, you can lighten or darken it, you can um, modify the contrast, there's reverse grayscale, um, you can sharpen it or smooth it, um, you can zoom in and out, you can measure things, you can do special colorization, all sorts of really kind of um, neat tools to play with. So here's an example of how an image can be enhanced. This third root back here is kind of ghost-like, but here it just super stands out really nice and strong um, after they've done this root canal. Um, but so that's showing a nice um, way to be able to enhance it. Um, grayscale inversion. This is the grayscale inversion. Everything that's white turns black. Everything that's black turns white. Um, you know, it's interesting to look at. I don't know if it makes it necessarily more diagnostic, but the bone level sort of sort of sticks out a little bit better, I almost think. So that's kind of an interesting, um, an interesting, interesting thing to be able to see. And then colorization, um, this is your traditional black and white film, and then this is the colorized film. So again, I don't, I don't really know. I guess you can sort of, it sort of makes the bone level look a little bit more 3D, like you can sort of see where some areas um, you know, because this is just our 2D, traditional 2D, we can't really see um, any of the morphology of the roots or the, the way the bone is um, thicker or thinner on the facial or lingual, but this sort of helps, I guess, as long as you kind of understand the colorization. I don't know if it does too much for diagnostic, but it's kind of neat to look at. So there's been a lot of studies um, when it comes to uh, digital imaging and if it has improved um, practitioners ability to diagnose and they really found that it doesn't show a significant difference um, you know people can diagnose off of a traditional film that's been exposed well you know there's no um, errors or you know things like that and or they can diagnose off of a digital image and they haven't really stated that studies haven't really shown that one is really superior to the other as far as diagnostics go, which is kind of interesting. So periodontal evaluation of the bone level, most studies also show no difference between a digital film um, and a traditional film being able to diagnose with the, the bone level. So it, it, even though there are wonderful advantages, our ability to diagnose hasn't really changed even with the digital um, radiographs. So some of the concerns are, of course, the initial startup costs, I said, can be very high. The sensors um, are, can be very large. They've worked on that a lot over the years, but you can see the, the footprint of where the actual sensor was active was smaller than the whole size of the sensor. So you get this really big, hard thing to put in patients' mouths, and you know they didn't like films to begin with. So it, it didn't really make it more comfortable in the beginning, but they have worked on it. Um, then let's see, um, we talked about their patient comfort. Increased risk with handling expensive items, so you really want to train your, your staff to you know, be respectful um, of the equipment, understand the, the cost and how to take care of it and how to you know, be careful with it, all that. Requires special sensor holders. Um, 
because of the shape of the sensor. Um, so you have to purchase all new sensor holders and you have to purchase enough to last you a whole day with all your rooms. So, I mean, doctors, the, the initial cost is huge because, you know, you might be talking, you know, two to four sensors and then, you know, many, many sensor holders for each room at, at least, you know, probably three um, to start out with per room because you, then you'd, you know, you'd be um, processing them throughout the day. But so it's a pretty, it's a pretty big investment out the gate. Um, other concerns, the sensor longevity. No one really knows exactly how many image, images can be captured, but they've estimated it's upwards of 10,000 images, which is, you know, good. But um, the CCD, um, you, you don't want to damage the cord. That's like basically the biggest, well, that's the weak part is the cord. Um, so you want to find out what kind of replacement policy the company has that you're buying it from. And then with the phosphorus plates, you don't, you can't bend it. You want to be careful not to scratch it. Um, and then you have to think of a budget for replacing sensors because those will start to get scratches and then you'll see the scratches on your um, image after you've taken it. So I just put this in here because we actually have this snap array in our clinic. Um, and I just, I hadn't used it. I, I had never set it up before. So I just thought, oh, that's how you set it up. So this is, this end is the anterior with the cord going down. And then this end is the posterior and the cord kind of goes off to the side. You can see they kind of wrap the cord around it. I thought it was kind of interesting the way they wrap the cord, made it kind of tight. Um, and then here is just a reminder. Um, I, I know we forget sometimes in um, lab, but this is just a reminder that when you're taking anterior PAs, your cord goes down and along the side of the bar. You always want the end of your sensor that's um, more flush to be up against the palate or in the floor of the mouth without something bulky in the way, like the end of the cord. So we'll talk a little bit about special imaging and the cone beam computed um, tomography. Um, this is a really neat, these are some other special imaging too that at the very end we'll just touch quickly on. But this is really neat. Tomography is a technique that uses cross-section throughout the body. It was mostly used in medicine for years and years and then in 1999 they um, started making CBCT um, units for oral maxillofacial dentistry, you know, that that realm. And it's it's amazing because everything that we've used for imaging has been 2D up until we started having the CBCT. So it's really, really, um, it's become really desirable technology because of the, its accurate and detailed information it provides. I mean, it, it can help dentists and um, specialists knowing where the, the mandibular nerve li lies or planning implants and how they're going to angle the implants or where the sinus is. Do, do they need a sinus lift? I mean, so many things. Impacted teeth or, um, you know, some kind of lesions that are growing. I mean, it's just endless the amazing ways that this is um, beneficial for um, dentistry and um, oral surgery. So the 3D CT scan, also available for analysis of bone and oral cavity for proper placement of implants. I already said that. Um, so it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So there's something called the field of view, um, and that can be adjusted. It basically means how much of the head are you focusing on. Um, but no matter what size your field of view is, um, the field of view provides accurate dimensional measurements um, the patient with a one-to-one -one ratio relationship. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, very accurate. The, the amount of distortion is, is really, really almost nothing, which is amazing. That's why, why it's so um, preferred. So let's see if I have anything else here in my notes. Um, the CD scan software can be added to a panel machine, um, uses radiation, but is computer generated with no film or screens needed. Anatomic features within the field of vision provide accurate dimension. We said that. So, okay, let me go to the next slide. So this just shows how, like, with a traditional x-ray source, it's sort of a fan, but with the CBCT, it's a cone. So that's what gives it that three-dimensional, because it's a cone of um, x-rays. Here's um, just an example of um, a CBCT scan and just 
seeing kind of one slice basically into different areas of the head. Um, then you can see here how it looks far more 3D. And then you can see this image is kind of showing how they're planning a, an implant. So they're see, they can see where the sinus is, they can see how deep they have to go, they're getting like a little target, this is where we're going to set it up. Here you can see the mandibular nerve, I mean it's just, it's just amazing and it's pretty easy. The patient just stands there and it goes around their head just like you know with a pano, it's super simple. Here's an example that shows the field of view. So you can see it can be all these different fields of view and some machines will um, do more variations than others. So it just depends on the manufacturer and the machine that's purchased. Here is an example of a third molar lying um, close to the nerve and then this is like a big cyst basically. So they're able to see pathology and the and teeth in relation to the nerve. Here are some other um, pathologies happening or some inverted, these might actually, actually this might be an inverted um, central incisor right here and then that's a canine. So they can just see orientation of teeth and just all sorts of really neat things. So some other special imaging, um, so it says what type of image is this? Um, you guys can't answer back so I'll just tell you this is the CBCT. And what's important information, what important information does this image show? So do you see anything in the jaw area that you might think, oh, what the heck is that? If you were looking at this, then that is what you're supposed to be noticing, and that is an impacted canine or a side a canine that's kind of gone sideways there. So what angle does this image show? I don't know really what the question is there, but I think it's it's showing that for, from this view, you're coming in um, more from the lingual view. So that's what's neat about it, is you can see from different directions. And then here is, um, what was this radiograph used for? So this one here shows them um, placing an implant and what direction and how deep and all that, the angle of the implant. So they use this to, to help place an implant. So another type of special imaging is a um, lateral cephalometric, and this is mostly used um, with orthodontists. And it's a tom uh, tomographic image. It's one plane is selected. And um, again, I said like it's commonly used for orthodontists. And then the uses are to evaluate um, or predict skull growth, um, evaluate trauma, or developmental abnormalities. Then there's TMJ tomographic, and this reveals bony details of the TMJ. Um, it can evaluate for any kind of temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, and then there's various views that can be attained for the variation, so they can adjust it to see a different view so that they can see what's going on if there's temporal um, mandibular joint dysfunction. So here's a transcranial TMJ projection. It's a tomographic method of dental imaging. The x-ray beam is directed down across the top of the temporal bone. You can kind of see it here in this image. It's coming down through the temporal bone to the head of the condyle on the opposite side of the skull. It's a single plane image and it aids in the diagnosis of lesions, fractures, and tissue changes. And then here we have an MRI. It's a cross-sectional image, um, no radiation exposure to the patient. Common uses in dentistry include um, evaluation of the temporal mandibular joint, the soft tissue around the joint, and then pathologic um, conditions. And here is an image of uh, an MRI of the joint there. And that's really neat. You can see the articulating eminence and the glenoid fossa in the condyle in the Pretty neat. All right, and that's the end of that.